Yes. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Agriculture Geos Agriculture Action Group session. And I would like to ask from the technician to uh, upload the to present the first presentation and give me the ability to change the slides from here. So, before we start with the presentations, just to setting the stage, uh, the session it will last one and a half hour. We do have seven presentations, uh, seven presenters. Four of them, they have a physical presence. Three of them will be online. So it will be a bit difficult and challenging uh, session. We will see how we will manage it. I believe that everything will go OK. And for each presenter, we have allocated eight minutes time with uh, two minutes of question and answers. At the end of uh, the presentations, we will, have, we will have a round table that was uh, in the program, but uh, we decided to make it an open discussion with uh, not only with the presenters, but with all of you, and to see which will be the next steps for the Agriculture Action Group. Um, of course, the title for this session is uh, Harnessing uh, Earth Observation for Sustainable Agriculture, Challenges, Opportunities, and the Path Forward. Uh, I am Sergio Kotsopoulos. I am the chairman of uh, this uh, action group. And uh, the objectives of this session is to assess the long-term impact of the EU Agri projects, highlight successes, challenges, and lessons learned, explore innovative ways of funding mechanisms and partnership models, and see which will be the next steps for the Agriculture Action Group. Yesterday we had a discussion, an open brainstorming discussion. And uh, the good thing it was that uh, this uh, session, it was infused with not only with people coming from the agricultural sector, but also with people coming from other sectors working with earth observation data, and we have exchanged some, let's say, experiences. Uh, also, the challenges that they faced in similar projects, but in different sector. And we conclude that one, uh, let's say, the most important part is how to engage users, how we are making our services user-centric, because there is the, academic, the academia, the scientific world, also the technicians, and there is also the actual users. And sometimes we need to find how to meet these uh, requirements between these three different groups. Uh, so we highlighted the importance of co-designing with end users for accurate data and uh, see how to build a nice calibration validation framework for these services. Something that it was very important, it was the need for collaboration between different sectors uh, to make an interoperability of skills, uh, not only for data and technologies, in order to share our results and experience and making our project more resilient and our services better for the final user. We also talked about the data challenges and technological challenges that we all faced and uh, how at the end, although there is a plethora of data in our time, how we can make this data useful at the end for the user in order for them also to pay for these services and make it sustainable. For this session is to see uh, some examples of projects that they are considered as success stories. Success stories because they have already used Earth observation data and have already developed services that they are selling to the market. So uh, we do have different sectors from the agricultural sector. So the first presentation from space to field using earth observation data to climate, climate crisis in agriculture. It will be presented by Dr. Dimitrios Kateris and it will present some results from the Stargate and H2020 project. And it will actually uh, present how the earth observation data are used for climate smart agriculture. The second presentation is from Anna Osan, uh, Dr. Anna Osan, uh, coordinator of Diana, Koala, and also Rexus project. And uh, she will talk about 
they obey water management and agriculture from innovation to practice. So how through all these projects, all these years, they develop some commercial services based on earth observation. Uh, the third presentation, although it says that it will be uh, presented by Dr. Juan Suarez Beltran, it will be uh, presented by uh, Jesus Ortuno Castillo, uh, who will actually give some examples, successful examples of how to use earth observation data for international development in the global south. Uh, then we will proceed with Mr. Gregory Migdakos from Caravias uh, in Greece, underwriting agency, that it will present how they are using services for the agricultural insurance sector developed through the H2020 project called Beacon. Uh, the next presentation, it will be for Apollo, a project that uh, actually it developed some commercial services for the farming sector, and it will be presented by Ms. Dimitra Perperidou. Um, the uh, other presentation is dealing with a, a hot topic, uh, soil health and earth observation, and it will be uh, present some results from the uh, CU Soil uh, H2020 project, and it will be presented from the assistant professor, uh, Irimi, Dr. Irini Pandazi. And the last, uh, but not least presentation, it will be uh, made by the National Paying Agency of Lithuania, where they are, uh, give us um, our uh, uh, the examples, tangible examples of how they are using and how they have incorporated earth observation data in their operational activities uh, of uh, their organization. Finally, we will close uh, the uh, session with a round table that it was what the program said, but uh, I think that uh, we have discussed everything uh, about the sustainability. So uh, the last 15 minutes, it will be dedicated to an open discussion of what will be the next steps and the strategy for the next year for the uh, Agriculture Action Group. So uh, let's begin from uh, our first Presenter, Dr. Dimitrios Kateris from my sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Stelios. I will. Uh... You do have eight minutes. <laughs> Dimitris, <laughs> if you, you uh, exceed yeah. this uh, threshold, I will catch you politely. <laughs> I will catch you <laughs> at the end. Uh, give me some uh, seconds in order to share my screen. Are problems. Can you see my screen? No. No. A second. Now? Yes. We can okay. Start. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, uh, good morning from my side. My name is. Uh, uh, Dimitris Kateris. I am a senior researcher at the Institute of uh, Bioeconomy and Agritechnology of CERT. And uh, I will um, discuss with you um, about the using of uh, earth observation data to combat climate uh, crisis in agriculture. Next slide. Well, it I think it's useful to say some uh, words about the climate smart agriculture. It's the agricultural strategies to secure sustainable uh, food safety under climate uh, change. Um, the CSA has uh, three pillars, of course, the productivity, the adaptation and uh, the mitigation. 
the Earth observation data is playing a crucial role in promoting uh, climate smart uh, agriculture uh, by providing valuable information to farmers, researchers, and policymakers. Uh, here you can see uh, some uh, crucial example, some uh, crucial examples for uh, how Earth uh, observation data is uh, assisting uh, CSA. As you can see, the first one is the crop monitoring and the yield uh, prediction. This data helps in uh, monitoring uh, crop conditions and uh, predicting yields, uh, enabling farmers to make uh, informed decisions on irrigation, fertilization, and harvesting. The second one is the broad monitoring and water management. The third is pest and disease uh, surveillance. Um, this one is early, it's about early warning systems based on this uh, data, uh, allow farmers to take uh, preventive uh, measures, um, reducing the use of pesticides and minimizing uh, crop losses. The fourth one is the climate risk assessment, the soil health uh, assessment, of course, the precision agriculture, this approach uh, enables farmers to apply the right amount of inputs at the right time and place, reducing, uh, reducing costs and environmental impacts. The next one is the insurance and financial services. Of course, the supply chain and market access, uh, land use planning and sustainable development. And final, uh, the, the final one is the research and policy development. All these examples illustrate the diverse applications of Earth observation data in uh, supporting uh, CSA and uh, addressing the cha challenges uh, posed by climate change to agricultural sustainability and food safety. Some of these examples, are, we, we have some of them uh, at our project. In our project, uh, the project is the Stargate project. It's a Horizon project. Uh, as you can see, uh, the consortium uh, in this project, we have uh, 27 partners, 26 from Europe and one from uh, Israel. The budget is uh, about, it's approximately uh, 5 million uh, euros. And we have 16 uh, uh, pilots in uh, six uh, different uh, countries. Well, here you can see the Stargate uh, objectives. Uh, I can say but that uh, the project is based on Earth observation, uh, weather intelligence, and IoT technologies. It supports uh, effective farm management and related options for uh, adaptation to climatic changes, local and regional policy formulation, leading uh, to better uh, landscape management. Uh, the project implements the Living Lab uh, approach by connecting the research organizations, policy making organizations, ICT companies, farmers, and other stakeholders to shape a CSA multi actor uh, regional framework. Uh, finally, it provides inno innovative components for the realization of big data with an emphasis of geospatial visualization and uh, dynamic uh, charting. Here you can see the Stargate data sources from different, uh, different sources. And of course, we have developed sub-weather uh, services uh, the first we have the first one is about the medium range weather uh, forecast. As you can see, the farmer can take information about the precipitation, about the the temperature, about the the wind speed. We have weather services. Uh, we have uh, the data providers who gave us uh, the, all the uh, all the data all the data we we want in order to make the medium range uh, multimodal ensemble weather forecast of course we have except uh, the weather uh, services we have the climate services 
and we have developed a sub-seasonal and seasonal forecasting. We have the data providers in order to feed uh, the Bayesian uh, models for the sub-seasonal and seasonal forecasting. Dimitri, sorry for interrupting yeah. you. You have only two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Yeah. I have a, a, a few slides. No, it's okay for me. Okay, thank you. Um, we have um, we have developed a, a, a platform which give useful information to farmers and agricultural uh, consultants. We take information from the earth, uh, data from earth observation and meteorological data in order to make some tools to give useful information from tillage, planting and seeding, fertilizing, spraying, irrigation, and uh, harvesting. We developed a decision support system. We collect some indicators about the, about the soil, the water, the topographic, and uh, et cetera, in order to make a database from crop and land uh, use sustainability. And finally, uh, the planting and uh, we make a strategic climate smart land uh, use planting and uh, management in order to give all the useful information to the end users uh, in order to make your productivity uh, bigger. And finally, the last slide, as my friend uh, Stelio said, it's time to focus on the people not on the technology. I think it's, I agree with this. And uh, I think it's time to see the needs of the end users and from our side to give them uh, all the necessary tools in order to make uh, them, uh, to make uh, their productivity higher. That's from my, my side. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have time for one question, either from uh, the audience here or from someone uh, from uh, that they are, from those that they are participating virtually. Any question from the audience? And if there is no question from the online, so I think Dr. Osan, you can come up and start your presentation. Good morning. First part of technology result. Yeah. Yes. It's interesting. We talk about satellites and a lot of technology, and then sometimes it's the simple things that do or do not work. So actually, we're oh. I'm getting oriented here. So I did my homework and put the title on the, uh, on the template, but here's also a quick list of things that I will be touch upon. And very important, the, the most important word in the title is the last one, practice, practice, practice. And I'll show you three different examples at three different skills of agricultural water management. And in the line below, you see many, many projects uh, which we are drawing from and have been drawing from. First of all, let me tell you a story. It's a long story, but you only get the short version. Once upon a time, there was an aquifer in the southeast of Spain. People living there happily because they had water underneath and they were pulling up the water and were fertilizing and irrigating their crops and harvesting their crops. And they were pulling more and more water. And what happened? Well, the water table was going down, 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 down. At some point, the central government in Madrid got the alert and they said, enough is enough you're not going to pull any further drop of water from this aquifer. Oh my, said the farmers, what do we do? 
It is, and well, it was and it still is, a big aquifer, 10,000, more than 10,000 wells, and a lot of people living there, but hardly any rain. So the situation was actually desperate. But then farmers did not want to give up. They were organizing, self-organizing, were talking to the university, and we've actually had already started to develop algorithms to get information from the satellites. So uh, that was when we started almost 30 years ago. It was in 90, 1995 when the first tools for uh, groundwater management and governance uh, were developed. And I'm trying now if I can. Yeah, so you see the aquifer levels here, and you see the years here. So with time, the technology managed to bring the groundwater table up again. And it happened because the information had become available. And the information in the community organizing process has been shared, which created transparency. So these three things together are really crucial. And that was when, well, people, this is the Irrigation District Board of uh, La Mancha Oriental. They have each year in November, there is uh, an assembly where the annual cultivation plan is decided based on EO information. And they all decide together. So it's a collective management. And so that was when in 96, the project Ermot was born. This project, it's not a, an EU funded project. It is a, let's say, local regional project. The farm escaped a third of the money. The River Basin Authority gave another third and the regional government of Castilla-La Mancha gave the final third. So it was actually other finance between farmers and public administration. And the farmers, they found that the Junta Central de Regantes, and this model of uh, groundwater management, groundwater governments, has become known as the model of, of Mancha Oriental. And it's also uh, an, an example of what I normally call, uh, we're connecting heaven with the satellites and earth where the tractors are. What is the innovation behind all that? I will not dwell on this uh, slide very much because you are, well, hopefully know about the water balance. So this is the only, well, uh, I was going to say this is the only secret in the technology. Of course, then there are secrets, quote unquote, and um, tricks how to do the different turns in the water balance. But basically, it is a gridded water balance fed by satellite images week by week or whenever they come in. So this is the innovation, and you've heard already about the practice, which has helped us to get the abstractions down to a sustainable level. How much time do I have left still, yes? Five okay. minutes for you. Okay, thank you. So th then I have time to show also this, uh, which is a part of this uh, governance model. As I said, it's self-organizing, self-government of, of the farmers and the satellite, quote unquote, sees it all. So if one farmer, for example, declares, oh, I have this year two cycles of lettuce, that's 5,000 cubic meters per hectare. But then the satellite comes and sees there are three cycles, which is of course uh, a lot more water. And then this leads to uh, an irrigation jury session where the farmer is heard and where the um, the district board is heard, and then a solution is found normally in terms of a sanction. They get less water in the following year, and in very rare moments, they also have to buy a, to pay a little a sanction. And that has actually helped to bring down the sanctions from, well, over 20 years ago to, on, to very, very little cases. So this is the... Uh, successful model of Mancha Oriental. On this slide, the only important thing is the blue. 
Tech, well, the other things are important, but we only have the eight minutes here. So technology is not enough. The community process and the people is the important co-governance with also with political will from the authorities. So do farm, this is a thank you slide for everybody contributing. Now, the model of La Mancha Oriental, we could say, and they happily live forever to finish the story, but sadly enough, that's not the case. The disruptive thing has been happening the last two or three years. You recognize the crop here, it's pistachio trees. There are investors, and they have been investors coming in and starting plantations, normally quite, quite big, uh, 1,000 hectares or so, of pistachio in intensive, so that's guzzling up all the water. So we are faced with a situation for which we need to find a new solution. Solution is not yet on the table, stay tuned. Now I jump the last two minutes to a smaller scale. This is a, a farm and they have uh, parcels and plots. And this is a totally commercial application which came up at the end of Fatima, but also many, many previous projects. So what the farmers get is either, oh, that was too early, is either on their cell phone, the millimeters for their plot for next week irrigation, or they simply, I mean, they were asking for, for a PDF, so they get this PDF for different parts of the different parcels and the millimeters that uh, are needed in the coming week. Eurimap's commercial service, fully sustainable and paid by farmers, users at different scales, small ones, big ones. And last but not least, we're jumping in scale again to the whole river basin. Now this is the uh, Hooker River Basin, which includes Valencia City. And um, also, well, the uh, city where we are based in Albacete inland. Water accounting is again based on the water balance, and we've done it in the context of the project REXUS. And the next step from water accounting is actually to calculate the water footprint according to the norm set by uh, Hoekstra, so that follows the, uh, um, let's say, almost certified procedure. The interesting thing about that application is that it has a political implication. You see down here the red circle, and you probably cannot read it, so I need to tell you what's in there. Uh, the uh, water footprint is part of the river basin plans, which need to be delivered every six years within the Water Framework Directive. And our Rexus water footprint came just in time two years ago when the Hooker River Basin Authority needed to renew this, send in the new hydrological plan. So it is now the Rexus water footprint for agriculture is now part of the uh, Hooker River Basin plan. And I will quickly jump on this and just say thank you to the Project Rexus for giving us the money to do it, and thank you all. Thank, thank you, thank you Thank you for being here with us. Uh, we have time for only one question, either from the audience or from the uh, online participants. Uh, please. Oh, thank you for the presentation, Anna. Who was the most difficult to 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 get involved in this uh, change of doing things, uh, the farmers or the policy makers or the scientific community? And how did you do it? Very good question, Marcia. <laughs> uh, actually, the farmers uh, were the easier part because they sort of have been growing up with us, with the technology, with, they told us what they needed. And then we did it, and they said, yeah, no, you need to tweak this and this and that. So that was the easy part. Policymakers, they are, have many constraints. So we needed to fit into all these constraints. And the, how we did it was that we've had for almost 30 years very good personal relationship with the Real Basin Authority and, uh, of, of Hukar, and also with the, the ministries in Madrid. So basically, personal 
uh, communication and good relation is probably the way to not only just look at, at the laws and everything, but do it in a personal way. Thank you, Dr. Rashan. So, Jesus, I think that you are the next one. And now, now it's working. And I stand back. Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Jesus Ortuño. I'm a geographer. And that's why I'll, I'll be talking about the challenges in the, in the global south. Uh, the essential role in earth observation. I'll comment on a, on a project that we, from GMB side, which is the company I work in, uh, we've been coordinating for the past five to five-ish years. Let's start with with the challenges. Let's say about the put for put it into a into a context. You are all aware of this of the chart. You know that last July was the hottest uh, register, and well, this is one of the main concern. But I want to hesitate to to see uh, this chart face by face. I don't know if you can reach it, but we. We are 8 billion people living in the planet. The population is, has been increasing and, and that uh, had put some, some troubles or some challenges further for, for the human beings on the, on the planet. I don't know if you are aware of this concept, which is the multidimensional poverty index in which take into account the multidimensional, as he said, uh, poverty that came across all the all the so most of the people in the or the mi minorities in the around the planet that uh, have poverty. We'll see if it's a minority or not in a few slides, but or how we can call a minority uh, in those terms. But we see here that the main dimension will be health, education, and living standards. Then you you can have many values. Uh, I put the source of the of the of the document here for you to check it if if you feel that could be in some interest for you. And I would like to uh, focus the attention on on this side in which in South. Sahara Africa is wider than, than in the rest. You see, uh, it's not uh, by chance that from the past, uh, we'll see five, 50 to 60 years, it was like uh, 214 COPs of attend, uh, COPs attend in, in Africa, just 50% uh, of them succeed. And as you know, during the past, uh, the end of the summer, we got the, the, la the latest one in Gabon. And that, I, I think it won't surprise anyone. I don't think that will be the last one that we see in the coming months, weeks, I mean, years, for sure. Uh, but this is a difficult, that I wanted to, to raise this context and see how we can picture all of this problem that we are facing at global scale especially, as it said in the presentation, the Global South. And I think we, we should uh, put uh, attention on the, on the part of, of what uh, Earth Observation can do. And in terms of food security, food insecurity, here are the, are the numbers, here are the figures. We'll see we have across the, across the, the world 155 million of people across 50 countries that was taken into account for the study that acute, experienced acute food insecurity for the, in, the, in, two, in 2020. That's, just, you know, that's what I meant when I said minority. I mean, we are talking about 155 million of people. Uh, but we can even go further if we see that 700, and 50 million people are exposed to severe food insecurity levels in the, in the past years. In the, this came from a study published in 2020 and the dates for 2019. But the figure, the global figure is that 
two billion people did not have access to safe nutrition and sufficient food in the planet. We are eight billion, two, mil two billion people uh, did not have access to safe, nutritious and sufficient food. I mean, I, I, I lose uh, sleep over this sometimes. Um, and I know it's a big challenge and we won't be solving it, but we can contribute to help uh, this situation. And who knows? I mean, I think uh, the changes won't be done by one, one person. Uh, you know, I, I believe in the quote that says that a, a thoughtful, a group of thoughtful people can change the world. And here, I think we are thoughtful and for sure we are a group of people. So I think we can probably have some chances to contribute in, in helping these, these challenges. Well, it's not a surprise for any one of, of us that we have the agricultural monitoring systems that we could, I mean, we have eight, eight or more than eight main different regional and global scale monitoring systems that work near real time with real real time information. We also have the increase of computation platforms, tools for and tools for data production. We know we've been talking these days about Dias, Amazon Web Service, Google Earth Engine projects that have been presented here, initiatives that like this very own. Uh, we know Copernicus for, Gla for GeoGlam, GMS on Africa building, capacity building, uh, increasing it. We, we know about that. And also it's key that at this moment, Earth Observation is supporting food security assessments. We have direct evidence from, from Earth Observation uh, products that are taken into, into account for these assessments by international groups, initiatives, institutes, etc. And I'm here to, to talk about an um, experience that I have in the past years uh, as a success story uh, is the Africultures EU project. I was lucky enough to not only participate uh, in the project, but also to, as, to assist in person in, at most of the user workshops uh, for the Africultures project, in which I, I will tell you in a second more about what is Africulture or what we did, but let me talk to you for a second I'll hold you here for a second. Just to I'll, remind you that you have only two minutes. Two right? minutes, I will get there. Okay. <laughs> uh, in this user workshop, uh, users were able to co-create. And at the, since the very beginning, they were we were listening to their demands. We were listening to their needs. We were hearing what they want. We provided them an empty piece of paper, empty piece of paper, and, and they will uh, sketch the wish list. And from that, we will scaffolding the rest. Uh, then we come back a year after, and they will be able to see how we advance it. Uh, they will be will able to play, to ask for changes, to, you know, and then at the same time, as the project was going on and the user workshop were coming again, the user community was uh, being together, we were able to, to build capacity because they were asking how the, I mean, a simple thing like how can I download it to my desktop GIS, uh, GIS application because I don't have access to internet all the time. Things like that, that, uh, that was, I learned like really a lot all these past years. Okay, Africultas was an Horizon 2020 project. The goal was to enhance food security in, in African agricultural system through Earth observation, climate services, and geospatial analytics. The building blocks for the for the project were Earth observation uh, for evidence-based decision-making services. What I mentioned before: co-design, co-create, co-develop by users that help us to raise awareness and build capacity while we were engaging the user community and key stakeholders. That led us to attract interest and we paved the road to, to scaling up. The, those are the services, the major services and the products that came within it. And I'm closing right now, Stelius. I'm just getting into the, the end of the presentation. Well, we provide change through user involvement, that what I mentioned, co-create, co-design, co et cetera. Uh, through the Earth Observation and Climate Services that provide evidence-based decision-making, user-driven use cases 
that raise genuine interest from the user community, the uh, local uh, people, local stakeholders that were interested in this, that support, that help us support the, ra the awareness raising and also creating capacity development at the same time, that's quite important, to enhance agricultural land use planning, agricultural land policy, etc. All of this packed together with a ribbon in the theory of changing, but you know that we can create some impact and, and change. And finishing my last slide, sorry. Uh, only one word. Uh, what's next? We have uh, technology uprising, uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning, etc. We'll have got more data. Uh, we are increasing the capacity development, uh, capacity building. We have more skills, uh, local, we want to reach local uh, farmers, especially in developing countries. We will come back, uh, I'm, I'm talking now in terms of EO, we'll come with new application, land, uh, EO for land registry, agroforestry, agroecology, biodiversity, etc. So there is a lot of room for improvement. We have to do more, we can do more, we have, we are, thoughtful we are a group of people and we have the skills the knowledge and we are all here together and we can go beyond for sure so thank you i'm sorry for being thank you we will buy it jesus um any question from the audience uh And thank you, uh, Jesus, for representing Africa Cultures. You, you had a slide on what's next, but could you also comment a bit on, uh, because Africa Cultures is closed huh, since early this year, uh, which, in which countries this pre-operational service has been uptaken by users, by governments, some examples of um, governmental use that actually uses? Uh, yes, we have the use case. I don't know if Esther, you want to drop in and comment briefly, uh, but... Uh, I think uh, we got interest for in, in Kenya. We are actually in conversation. We uh, have interest to continue in Niger, but you know the situation there is a bit tricky at the moment. And we've got a lot of interest from uh, international entities that at the moment we are trying to figure out how to balance everything and go to build or scaffold on, on the knowledge and also the, the what we created. And, and go beyond. So, uh, well. with one word, just to say that operational the services are uh, already deployed from uh, the previous year on the Kenyan Space Agency, and now it will host the same platform, the results and services that are developing from other projects, uh, focusing in Kenya and Uganda, and uh, it will reuse the Africulture platform, the one that uh, set it up in uh, Kenya Space Agency, and it will follow some capacity building activities uh, with the scientists from the Kenya Space Agency, and not from only from the Kenya Space Agency, but also from AgriMed. There were uh, a big interest in using it also in another big project uh, funded by the European Commission from DG INPA, uh, CLIMSA. Uh, but unfortunately, after the coup of Niger, uh, we didn't have any news from their side. So thank you, thank Jesus. You. And uh, I will ask from uh, Gregory Migdakos uh, to share his presentation. And uh, Gregory, please, uh, I know that uh, what I'm asking from you is very difficult, but uh, please try to be swift and to the point. Thank you. I will try to. Thank you, Stelios. Thank you, everyone. Allow me one second to share my presentation, please. Uh, okay. Uh, is it visible to everyone? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, the opportunity to present the activities of Beacon Project uh, within this workshop. Yeah, it was a project that was very important for us. Uh, covering, let's say, aspects of our operations, covering aspects that are core activities within our organization. And to give you a little bit of uh, an insight, let's say, uh, idea about agriculture insurance, uh, we have to work, we have to cover farmers, we have to cover uh, livestock, we have to cover as a company working from 1986 and cover, let's say, the economic, but also the uh, social aspects of uh, agricultural enterprises among others. But what is going on within agricultural insurance? Uh, both us and other companies are providing a number of products 
to cover those losses and cover the activities of the farmers. So in general, we can group those in two major uh, agriculture insurance products. Those are called indemnity based. So we as insurance companies are paying out the calamities happening on the basis of assessed losses. And the second and emerging uh, product category, the index based agriculture insurance, where we pay out on the base of some pre-specified indexes. To give you, let's say, uh, a little bit further detail, on top of those two major categories, we have different products that cover either single peril, where again, the payout is on the base of the percentage of damage, multi peril, and by peril, we refer to flood, hail, fire, and so forth. So, where we pay out on the base of yield loss. Uh, the new category, as I said, that is slowly increasing and it has a huge potential for the use of EU data even further is the index based agricultural insurance products where uh, in general we have, let's say, three subcategories, either on top of area yield index, where accordingly, as it's the title, uh, the, the payout is uh, direct, uh, let's say, analogy to the area yield loss. Crop weather index, where the different products have specified the specific index, whether this is precipitation, whether this is temperature, and so forth, and accordingly triggers the payment on specific percentages, and of course, the last type, where it's again uh, very much supported by EO data, the vegetation index based, where there are a number of products either based on NDVI, biomass, and so forth. Lastly, we see also in several uh, countries uh, globally uh, the emergence of another so called, let's call it index based. Again, it's around crop revenue, and essentially what the, we uh, cover to the farmer is any losses with regards to yield or price loss. But why it is very important, uh, no matter of, let's say, the multitude of products for us to jump and exploit the EU data. Uh, let's, let's quickly follow up what the process is. For any indemnity-based agriculture insurance product, we have the occurrence of an event. The farmer takes his property and applies for a claim. Uh, he submits the claim to us or to any other insurance company. The insurance company reviews the claim and then sends his personnel, either in-house uh, adjusters, to check on to perform on-field visits, make the report, negotiate with the farmer the percentage of the damage, and then accordingly uh, make the payment of the claim. On the other hand, on index-based agricultural insurance, we follow more or less a similar approach. We have the occurrence of an event. We have uh, the data that coming to us through a third party, whether this is a national weather agency, whether this is a network of weather stations and so forth, to confirm the occurrence of an event. And then the insurance company reviews the data coming from the different entities as providers. And we then decide upon whether the type of index-based product, either to wait and confirm the loss at the harvest, so uh, sometime uh, between the event and the harvest date in order to assess the final claim that will be paid out or to directly trigger a payment. As you quickly understand, for us, it's a huge part of the activities on several aspects. First, to have the adjusters ready, whether uh, we have them in payroll, this is a fixed cost for us, uh, to have them stand by for any occurrence of an event, but also to deploy them, perform the uh, negotiation, perform the damage assessment, and come back to us. Similarly, in the index base, it, it was also for us a huge, let's say, center of cost with regards to where to find the data to assess whether indeed one of our insured farmers uh, have had any type of calamity to perform the review, but also depending on the index based product to make the infield assessment at the end of the harvest season in order to adjust and see how much the final claim will be paid. As you understand, those are, let's say, core. Uh, cost centers for us that can, depending on the company or depending on the area of the contracts, can reach up to 50 to 60 percent of our uh, company operational administrative costs. Two minutes left, Gregory. Yes. So for us, it was very important to address those, let's say, bottlenecks through the use of your data and transform our enterprise, but also to assist the sector to move from this uncertainty to future risk, the higher costs and the lower market for uptake or high premiums to build on top of EO 
based services of beacon crop monitoring, damage assessment, anti fraud, early warning, and so forth, and move to a more, let's say, prepared with the knowledge of future risk, with a more uh, to reduce our operational administrative costs with the damage calculator and have a better customer satisfaction, a better portfolio offering to our customers. Uh, we did use, of course, a Beacon, and Beacon was very important to us, allowing us to use Earth observation data, uh, weather information, blockchain technology, and we did pilot test the services uh, deployed within Beacon in Serbia, in Greece, and in Spain, but we also designed, on top of the added value of Beacon, a number of cases for Central Europe and Nigeria. Very quickly, what we built upon and what we did pilot test in several areas. Uh, we did pilot the damage assessment services for Hailstorm using Sentinel-2 data, floods with uh, the combined use of Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 data, frost again with Sentinel-2 data, wildfires, Sentinel-2 data, and for drought using also MODIS NDVI data and NDVI anomaly. So basically, what we uh, what we was the result? How useful uh, was uh, the Beacon infrastructure and the EU data to our activities? As you can see, we have I have named here our six main operations. With regards to underwriting, the EU data and the uh, were very helpful to our operations in order to have a better understanding of what's the future yields that we were questioned to either uh, secure to ensure or either perform payouts in the main, the near future. So for us, we will provide- 30 seconds, Gregory. Yes. Uh, very good climate risk profiles. We had the opportunity to, let's say, to empower our farmers, our sure farmers with uh, prevention information, especially with regards to hail, with short and medium range weather forecast information, to quantify event zones so as to know uh, where uh, initially an event took place and which farmers out of our portfolio uh, had to start the process of claim and damage assessment. Uh, we had very good, let's say, estimation of flood and fire damage to our insured farmers, average with regards to drought, frost and hail events. The uh, contract monitoring gave us very good information with regards to... Gregory, there is an end of time. <laughs> Unfortunately, I try to be polite, but, uh, you know, uh, time is pressuring. Uh, so if you can conclude, uh, yes, no. if you allow me to just showcase the next, uh, slide very quickly, uh, for us, the results were uh, that much positive that let's say we assimilated, let's call it like that. And we include the majority of the services and of the operations offered and deployed within Beacon. Uh, giving to us significant cost savings, but also increased transparency and customer satisfaction. Uh, we use them as we speak. We use them in designing uh, new products and serving the Greek market. And we hope that, let's say, within the future, the increased availability of uh, more satellites, of more sensor systems will allow us to improve assessments even further. Thank you, Stelius. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Gregory. We have only uh, time for one short question and um, for some up. Uh, there is one. Hi, good morning. A short question. How have you, have you assessed the accuracy of the indices you have developed for assessing the damages? Yes. As I, uh, let me go back to the slide. The, okay, as you can see here, we had a good estimation for flood and fire. So the damage assessment services provide were, let's say, uh, sufficient to give us a good indication that was also represented in the parcels, but it was average for drought, frost, and hail events. Uh, the issue here is, even though we were looking at the starters to have, let's say, quick information following an event, in most cases, let's say, on one hand, the lack of satellite images uh, was hindering or, let's say, uh, postponing a little bit the quick assessment following an event. 
and it's also what we also uh, have uh, seen in the pilot operations. Uh, no matter how, let's say, quick we had information following an event, we had to follow up until the uh, harvest date in order to have a better approximation of uh, yield impact in the parcel. And this is because, uh, as we witnessed in the project, in the project activities, uh, crops uh, can rebound if favorable conditions fall in event. Of course, in cases where the, the severity of the damage is not 100% at the time of the event. Thank you, Thank you Gregory. Thank you. I, I have to cut you. <laughs> Apologies, but... Uh... Uh, thank you for your presentation and for the time. Just to make one comment about the uh, pilot cases, because it was on the map uh, on the previous slides. Uh, I think, Gregory, it was more than uh, uh, 2,000 uh, different claims from uh, Serbia, uh, Iberia Peninsula, and other areas, where based on them, according to their needs, they have validated the services. Um, so. For uh, the next presentation, I would like to ask from uh, Ms. Dimitra Perperidou from Drax Environmental to share uh, her screen. And Dimitra, Hello, please Sergius. try Hello, try Sergius. to be swift. You know. Yes, of course. Can you see my screen, Sergius? So, um, hello everyone. Thank you for having me here. I'm here on behalf of Drax Environmental located in Greece to present Apollo uh, advisory services for small farmers based on Neo. So when Stelios asked me to share uh, post-project sustainability and long-term impact, I instantly thought of it as a journey. And it is a journey that we are still on. Um, sorry, I'm trying to change. Thank you. Uh, so every great thing starts with an idea followed by doubt and finally a resolve to abandon or pursue. And we're still pursuing what we started with Apollo a couple of years ago. Um, so Apollo in um, mythology, as you know, was the son of Zeus who wrote the Saria to bring light to the world every day, integral for all plants in order to grow, bloom and produce seed. And this is how our team gave birth to the idea of Apollo, an idea that, uh, as I will share with you, transformed through the years Keeping always a common denominator, though, help producers in their daily activities. Uh, the initial idea of Apollo focused on four services um, that would be developed using the power of Earth observation and combining it with agronomical algorithms and data sources to provide users with valuable information, such as, for example, the optimal or bad conditions for killing their field. Providing that information, they would be able to decide when to take action in order to minimize the environmental impact, avoid soil erosion, for example, or uh, at the same time achieve the maximum result. Uh, for creating such a tool uh, that would bring that knowledge to the end users, of course, their input uh, was not only needed, it was required. For that purpose, um, end users worked alongside developers, agriculturalists, scientists, earth observation professionals and other experts to bring the idea of Apollo to life. What you see here is our first attempt. It is the first step um, that we took, uh, as you will see later on, and this evolved. All this process um, took more than two years. We did not only have to invest time to develop the platform, we needed to invest time to validate the services that we were providing to our end users. So this is a very lengthy process. We needed um, in situ data for every crop, different data sets, take into consideration aspects like the seasons or the weather that can be very, very um, uh, a parameter that we cannot foresee. Uh, concluding with Apollo, though, the, did not end our, um, the journey that we were set on. As I said, we pursued what uh, the next steps. So um, we rebranded Apollo and launched it into the market and thus began another journey. Again, closely working with our users and keeping it and keeping um, as a pillar of the agronomical and earth observation expertise, we added to what we had started developing um, a few years ago, adding, for example, new services, uh, as is um, the fertilization service or the CO2 service, 
all now dri all again driven uh, from end users, either farmers or companies. So um, working closely with our users, observing them, uh, we also managed to add new features um, in what we were doing. Sorry, um, new crops, um, uh, new new features, as I said, like um, the crop calendar that we took some some years to develop, but um, adding to that export or other little things that could make their work. Uh, easier um, and their daily activities um, easier to do. So um, I don't want uh, to take more of the time. We did uh, bring everything, um, made adjustments um, during the years to the user interface, as you saw, always ensuring that our product is up to the standards of the user, fulfilling their needs and making their life easier. But um, what I would keep as a lesson learned is um, uh, that we need to continue lever leveraging the power of uh, earth observation and combining with agricultural knowledge. We will keep on evolving. And as Darwin said, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one that is most responsive to change. So thank you, Stelios. Actually, this is my expression right now. Any question from the audience? Or someone from the uh, online participants? So I do have a question, uh, Dimitra, because we do, now we do have the time. Um, tell us more about what was the journey of uh, uh, bringing these services to the farmers and uh, uh, actually discussing with them on how to make them useful for them and their operations. Thank you for the question. So I mentioned it briefly, we are always working with users and they are the ones that drive uh, the, what you see and what we share here with you today. It is always um, a challenge uh, to work with users because they, you have different inputs, uh, different needs that you have to combine to bring them together. Uh, and to give a result that would um, uh, make happy uh, most of them, they will make uh, that would make their life easier and their daily activities easier. So now I would like to ask from uh, Assistant Professor uh, Dr. Irin Padazi uh, to come and present about the observation aspects of soil health. So, um, initially, uh, I was going to discuss about uh, how the term uh, soil health and what uh, it does uh, convey. And uh, we're going to in discuss about the earth observation data and how many types of them are uh, used in our applications for the earth observation towards uh, soil health. How are these uh, data um, are acquired and how are these uh, processed through the different and latest trends uh, that are applied around earth observation. And finally, the occasion of uh, the sea soil and its results, uh, its related results and some sort of discussion about the limitation and challenges that we have faced or all the projects that are related towards the soil health and uh, the sustainable uh, land management uh, um, have to do with. So initially, the soil health, uh, most of the times is uh, the term is mixed uh, with uh, uh, the soil quality. But uh, the term of uh, the soil health also has a special characteristics. Uh, it, is, uh, it concerns the continued capacity of soil so as to function in a vital living system containing its uh, own ecosystem and its land use boundaries. So we have to maintain and sustain the biological uh, productivity 
uh, in order to enhance its quality, uh, to uh, manage better the water, and uh, of course, um, ensure human, uh, animal, and uh, plant health. Regarding uh, the Earth observation, data has been very um, has been proven a very instrumental and useful uh, tool uh, for managing the soil health. So they provide us with uh, different insights in various soil parameters, processing, so as to give us the opportunity to do some decision making in order to uh, ensure the sustainable land use and in order to preserve uh, the vital role uh, the soil has as a resource. So there are many things that you already know, the optical data, the radar data, the infrared and thermal data are uh, employed to the service of uh, the Earth observation. So as to reach conclusion about uh, uh, the vegetation analysis, the island, uh, the land use classification, uh, the terrain mapping, uh, um, the temperature monitoring, the terrain monitoring, uh, and also the volcanic activity as well. There are also the hyperspectral data that has been widely applied lately for its conclusions about the crop health condition and the pollution monitoring. There is the LIDAR data for the urban planning, the disaster risk assessment, and the multispectral data that are able to capture um, many differences uh, in order to um, demonstrate uh, discrete spectral basis. So recent insights of the observation data in the soil health convey the soil composition and its properties so as to reach information about uh, the presence and the essential of nutrients, organic matter, moisture content, and soil structure, uh, the land use and the land cover changes that uh, allows us um, to change the land use and uh, particularly towards the uh, climate change. The erosion and degradation of soil by monitoring the changes in topography and vegetation. Sorry? Okay. So there are also many insights, including uh, the prediction of soil health, the sustainable land management, the crop health and productivity, and the identification of contamination. So uh, these data are acquired through satellite, aerial photography, ground-based remote sensing stations. And the latest trends, of course, convey some machine learning applications and uh, re high resolution remote sensing and the integration. Of course, this requires the integration of multi sensor data in order to serve the machine learning thing. So, what concerns about the uh, CHL project, um, its main task is to design and implement and test a safe uh, China EU-based observatory platform so as to provide and monitor the status of the third threats uh, towards soil and the land resources. Um, in order to support sustainable management um, of soil to increase uh, the productivity, its productivity, and to reduce the uh, yield uh, variability at less time and space. So, one of the tools that have been developed was the uh, geostatistical analysis and mapping towards the estimation of key soil quality, physical, and uh, fertility indicators in order to. Uh, Process the machine learning scanning and soil data sets and to create some smooth uh, interpolated soil properties. And of course, uh, the estimation of these uh, key soil uh, properties has led us into um, adapt key soil quality, physical and fertility indicators that has been done through our uh, Vine SAR um, spectra based uh, predictive algorithms. So there were uh, management zone maps produced and methodologies for the variable lay rate uh, fertilization. So uh, moving on uh, from the results uh, to the challenges, I would say from this experience that it's very important to define the policy priorities of parameters for the soil protection. 
And also, we need to define soil nutrient data sets uh, both uh, as individual indicators and as a composite indicator for soil uh, fertility. Apart from that, we need to assist the assessment of the cap performance uh, through assessing uh, the soil individual indicators and to propose and design the management the practices in order to improve uh, the agricultural uh, soils and to stop this uh, ongoing land degradation, uh, perhaps through variable rate fertigation or fertilization. Uh, of course, we should pay more attention at the model's interoperability uh, because it is very important from the part of the data analyst uh, experience to debug the AI models and make more informed uh, decisions. And last but not least, all this big data that has been produced think, has to be uh, recycled uh, in a way and to be uh, used uh, from uh, the future uh, projects and people for, for the future projects show us uh, to construct uh, a, a really sustainable uh, database and protocol so as uh, to protect uh, soil health. Thank you. Thank you, Irini. Any question from uh, the audience? Yeah. Ah, questions, okay. Okay, behind it was... Uh... Hi, thank you. Which uh, concept of... Uh... Which classification of soil health do you use in your research? Cornell soil health or some? Which, uh, which, which classification? Definition? Yes. Method for the machine learning? Well, no, 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 for the soil health. Soil health is a soil health index and which method do you use? Uh, the vegetation indices, you mean? You mean the vegetation? No, soil health index. You mentioned soil health. Maybe you use it, use the term, but without. No, no. Really I, I said it. that we we are going to. Uh, it, it it is part of the discussion. We I, we haven't used uh, soil indexes. Soil health. Okay. So, no, no. Okay. It has been used more uh, in a more uh, deliberate it, way. It was mainly on monitoring the parameters yes. affecting the framework of soil health because uh, back then, in 2019, when the project started, it was not so clear the definition of soil health as it is right now. Yeah. So it yeah. was to test the different technologies and data and to see how it will be useful for sustainable land use management. And but to, to answer to your question generally and not for the CGL projects, I think that the, there were 12 uh, soil indicators now defined, but this uh, paper has been published one year ago. So it is a really recent one. At this time, we have run the seashell. We, this picture wasn't really clear, so we have used the veget uh, vegetation indices in order to cover this. Thing. Of course you can. We are open to that. That's why I have proposed the sustainability between uh, previous projects and the future ones. Um, thanks for the presentation. I understood uh, you mentioned somewhere that it was a cooperation with China, and actually, obviously, yeah. this was a topic. Um, maybe we have a chat later, anyway, how that went. But did you have <laughs> concrete question? Did you have access to Chinese Earth observation data from satellites or something? Unfortunately, no. Uh, and it was not only for the Earth observation <laughs> data, but also to share yeah. other data and information with them. Yeah, it was really difficult, but okay. Thank you, Remy. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to ask for someone from the National Paying Agency. Thomas, you will make the presentation. Or Osius. Yeah. To come and share their experiences on working with European projects and developing earth observational infrastructure for their organization. With this, we can change the slides. Good morning, everyone. My name is Martina Srimgaila. I'm here on behalf of Oshius Kuczynskas. So let's kick off this presentation by delving into knowledge and experience gained by national paying agencies use of F observation data to monitor common agriculture policy requirements. 
Allow me to introduce uh, the Engage Agency's uh, uh, experiences, uh, uh, field of operation, and uh, I invite you to watch a short video and please pay attention to this beautiful lady. Sorry, no sound. Yeah, so main aspects. The Business lady. owners and oh, local communities perfect. by the Republic of Lithuania and the European Union, while using integrated administration and control system, satellite data, artificial intelligence, robotic software, and mobile applications for remote monitoring of supported agricultural activities. Lithuanian farmers and agricultural companies are continuously showing an active interest in employing new digital solutions for monitoring farmers' performance. So, unfortunately, this lady is just artificial avatar. So it's uh, a new technology we use in our agency to, communi to communicate with farmers because they don't like to read, but then they have a, a, a video, a short video with explanation, so it's more likable by farmers. So we pay 1 billion euros per year, so it's a huge amount of money, so we need to be sure. So what do we pay? And we have a, a CAP monitoring system, mobile app in Lithuania, it's called Anime Agro, and the backbone of all innovations we have in our agency is uh, projects. So I will shortly introduce them to you. Uh, the main tool we use, uh, the main input data we use in our AMS system is uh, Sentinel, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. And uh, this illustration is very helpful when we communicate with farmers. So each part of uh, Planet Earth is covered by images, so each parcel, each declared area also is seen by sentinels. So up to now, we created 24 markers, and it is like more or less uh, the same monitoring system in each uh, member state over the Europe Union, because it's mandatory starting from 2023. Uh, we enabled uh, the prevention system because from controls we moved to prevention because every 10 days farmers can see results uh, of monitoring and for example if the grass is still not cut so we send a message please farmer do your obligation and afterwards you will be paid for that so we have four Markers for land cover detection, arable and grasslands, knowledgeable objects, grassland mowing activity, 18 crop types, algorithms, and uh, follow land tillage detection. And luckily, we reached uh, 99% of accuracy of results. So it's, it's a huge number. Another big part uh, of our uh, system is mobile app uh, to receive uh, geotagged photos with evidences from the field. So first time it was used in 2018, uh, we up to now have 38,000 active users and uh, we don't use one way communication to farmers, just give us the photos, but two way communication and we provide all available information we have. So we have Sentinel time to Syria so farmer can scroll down his parcel and look through the data. Also, we published open data layers like declared parcels, Natura 2000, soil erosion. So everything what is necessary for farmer are in one place. And of course, other useful information. Yeah, so this year was very stressful for our agency because, because we received around 70,000 geotagged photos, average uh, 632 photos per day. And definitely we need new tools to, to deal with such a huge amount of photos. So we already tested some artificial intelligence based uh, solutions in EVA project and in-house pilot. So we uh, are available to detect 12 uh, different crops of uh, fruits, vegetables and berries based on geotagged photos. MPA is very active in projects uh, as as I mentioned, uh, 
projects are the backbone of all inno innovations we have. So we have two groups. It's uh, international projects with EU partners and projects we have in-house. Even we are looking uh, through all the finalized projects uh, which were held over several years or several months ago. So let's dive deeper into our project's ecosystem. So we have three main parts uh, marked in Hello, so NMA Agro, LPIS, GSA system, and Area Monitoring System. So each project has its own place in our uh, ecosystem. And I would like to highlight uh, the green ones. So we are still ongoing. So it is Envision project, uh, with this mobile app, with platform, with uh, uh, algorithms, markers we use in our area monitoring system, IFL for more environmental tools, uh, Aggregate value platform of platforms, and uh, the newest project Birdwatch uh, for bird habitants uh, modeling and uh, visualization. Yeah, so to overview uh, all projects, uh, there are three main objectives. So we need to we have projects with app platforms uh, for monitor and implementation of CAP requirements. Uh, another part is platforms uh, for environmental data and activity modeling, and of course, preparation of data sets of uh, markers and results uh, using satellite images, uh, drones, in situ data, and field photos uh, provided by farmers. And this is uh, the best part of uh, presentation, so example of successful results, because we are not just piloting, but afterwards we are implementing it into our operational level. Yeah, so uh, we have a Sentinel-2 image with deeply resolved resolution, boundaries delineated by artificial intelligence and uh, results provided in the platforms, uh, for example, by Envision Project. So this is a deeply resolved uh, image. We have two times per year and it's a uh, fully generated from Sentinel-2 and from 10 meter to one meter resolution. And this is the example how farmers see the imagery and deeply resolved boundaries uh, by artificial intelligence. It's, it's very impressive because in some parts you even cannot uh, decide it's by human or by, by computer. Examples of environmental data. So from Envision project, we have runoff zones, water pollution zones, burned areas, uh, and from IFL, organic carbon content, clay content, and erosion indicator. And uh, the newest project, BirdWatch, so we, have, we will have online platform based on remote sensing, uh, uh, species distribution models, uh, biodiversity indicators, uh, bird observation data, and we'll publish it online for farmers, for supervisory institutions, uh, policy makers, uh, NGOs, so each stakeholder will have something to see on the platform. And of course, we have some challenges to, to move forward. So we implemented AMS, Area Monitoring System, but it is just the beginning. We need more markers to detect, uh, for example, non tillage activity, organic farming, and it is quite difficult. Uh, we need to improve control of grasslands. And luckily, uh, this year we had the Envision project. Uh, they assisted us uh, with very good quality results. So we implemented it in our operational level. Of course, we need uh, AI tools for geotech photo recognition and improve farmers' uh, interaction with us, with all these new technologies. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Martinus. Um, any question from the audience? Someone or from those that they are participating online? Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I think if I checked quickly correctly, you're not participating in the partnership agriculture of data. Um, is there any reason or can maybe you can talk with Nicola Pirone after this presentation? <laughs> to discuss uh, the potential inclusion in, in the next proposal, because I think it's very nice and very relevant. Um, 
things you present. If we want to find out more about your methods, the technology, um, I missed it. I didn't, I didn't see any publication or anything. What's the best source? Is it the project website or? Yeah, so we have a nma.lt, our web page. So all projects are described there. But uh, if you need to find a concrete uh, method technology, you should look uh, at the project from which it was provided. So if you want more details, you can always contact us and we will provide with more details where to find. Okay, thank you. So if uh, there is no other question, thank you, Martinus. Uh, to conclude uh, our session, Erwin, I think that we are on time. Uh, and also I will have this one minute for you to make the announcement. But before this, just to make a conclusion uh, between the two days uh, yesterday that we discussed the barriers and challenges about the earth observation in agriculture. Now we saw the success stories where many projects, they delivered services, actual services that they are selling in the market, either from the public sector or either from the private sector. Uh, some of the projects, well, the majority of the projects were innovation action. Some others like uh, Africulture and CU Soil were research and innovation action, so they need some more time to uh, deliver uh, commercial results. So it seems that the sustainability of the earth observation infrastructure and uh, the funding mechanism that they are leading all these participants to develop their services seems to be working. And now I think that the next step is how we will continue to sustain this community of the Agriculture Action Group uh, and also not only to uh, sustain the same, but also to bring new persons and also uh, all the stakeholders that they are uh, working with the Earth Observation data, because it's not only the scientific part and the technical, but also there is the part of the users, the farmers, uh, the public agents, the, uh, agencies that they are using this and perhaps they have to uh, uh, offer more by their participation here and build a community around the Eurogeo.